threatening the use of nuclear Okay, got it. Um, there are two aspects of the nucleus as applied to international relations of war, nuclear power and nuclear weapons. And I want to deal with each of them uh, a little bit, since I only have a little time. First of all, nuclear power. Uh, Ukraine has four operating nuclear power centers. It gets somewhere more than half of its electricity from, nu from nuclear energy. That's much more, for example, in Michigan. Michigan gets something like 30% of, of its electricity from uh, nuclear energy. Ukraine gets more than that. In any case, uh, each, each uh, nuclear power center is, used, is covered with a big concrete uh, shell. And um, there's a very deliberate attempt to uh, destroy it by military action. The contents are more or less safe. However, there is a, still a lot of threats from a nuclear reactor. First of all, there is the reactor itself. It's very hot inside, and there's, these are, there's a necessity of keeping things cool. Keeping things cool requires circulation of water and electrical power. If the electrical power is cut off in any way over a short period of time, you will have an overheat, you have gases released, you'll have an explosion, which may or may not rupture the concrete shell and disperse radioactive materials um, all over the place. Let me remind you, we have no control over the winds. We don't know which way the radioactive stuff will go. It could go to the bad guys, it could go to the good guys, it could go anywhere. The other problem with nuclear power, of course, is outside of the nuclear reactor itself is a cooling pond because the nuclear fuel rods, after they use a certain amount of their fuel, are too hot to handle. And by hot, I mean both thermal heat and I mean radiation. radiation. And so they're put in pools to cool off and the cooling off may take several years. Now, if, if uh, in the process of the war, uh, a shell uh, were to hit the nuclear uh, cooling pool and disrupt some of those uh, cooling uh, fuel rods, again, uh, radioactivity will be spread all over the place. Let me remind you, of course, of what happened when a reactor did go. There's a non-functioning reactor in Ukraine, which I suspect you've all heard of, and that's the Chernobyl reactor. The Chernobyl reactor has been dead for a long time. That doesn't mean it's harmless. There is still a lot of uh, hot stuff in and around it. It's all protected by a shell. It's protected by cooling water, which requires cooling electricity. Uh, if any of that is disrupted and the fuel rods get too hot, again, they can disperse and travel all over Europe. Uh, I suspect some of you are old enough to, recommend, to remember what happened when Chernobyl uh, went to hell and uh, radioactivity went as far as Sweden, when covered a good part of what was then the Soviet Union and uncovered a bit of, these, of uh, Western Europe as well. It was not funny. Um, in any case, there has been fighting on the Chernobyl uh, campus. There are rumors, which I have heard mixed feelings about, that Russian soldiers were digging trenches in the grounds around the Chernobyl reactor, and some of them got uh, sufficiently radio poisoned that they had to go to a hospital in Belarusia. I've heard contradicting reports about that, so I don't know if it's true. But in any case, um, uh, nuclear reactors uh, basically rely on continuous uh, cooling, which requires continuous electrical energy, which requires uh, staff who are knowledgeable to keep eyes on things. Now, so far, all of this, the Ukrainian reactors are still being monitored by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And, and that, that agency claims that there's nothing to worry about so far. Uh, the, uh, the staff at the, uh, at, at the Chernobyl uh, were kept on duty for something like uh, over a week. The, the Russians took control of it, didn't let the staff leave because they had no staff to replace it. 
And without staff, the, the situation could go, have gone to hell, which is something you don't want to admit. Uh, so all in all, war is not good for the nuclear power. And as nuclear power becomes more and more uh, prevalent, uh, it becomes more and more dangerous. Uh, this is not to say that uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a critic of nuclear power. Every other source of energy is also a source of danger to its surroundings. And war is not good for anybody, including power stations. And now let me turn to what's really frightening, uh, nuclear weapons. Let me remind you that after the World War II, uh, we had nuclear weapons, the Soviets did not. Nobody knew how many we had. Actually, we had the, the number we had at the time where you could count on one hand, but nobody knew that. And so we were afraid that the Soviets would have done. They would march, they were marching west, they conquered Berlin. Uh, we, there was fear that they were going to march to the British Channel. What was going to stop them from marching to the British Channel? They had their army, we didn't. We demobilized very fast after the war. We're called a democracy. Our people wanted to go home. The Soviets were able to make sure that they kept their armed forces intact for a much longer time. And so the feeling was that, so, that nuclear weapons was prevented Stalin from marching west. Soon enough, the, the Soviets also got nuclear weapons. So now you had both parties with nuclear weapons. And, and now you, we confronted the possibility of mutual destruction, the so-called MAD, mutually assured destruction. And so for a long period of time, people thought that nuclear weapons was a way of guaranteeing peace because the, the, the destruction offered by nuclear weapons was so horrific and so universal that no sane person would want to co would contemplate going to war if any possibility existed of nuclear weapons being used. You notice I use the word sane. That's uh, something that we can't guarantee, unfortunately. Uh, in any case, uh, so we both had, we both had uh, large scale strategic nuclear weapons. And then the fear was, okay, those, the, the mutual assured destruction would keep us from using nuclear weapons. But then there's a, the Soviets still had a massive land army, and there was the fear that uh, the Soviets would march through Germany, the so-called Folder Gap, and there would be a, a Soviet tank army which would strike out. And by this time, we had nothing to stop it. And so we rapidly developed uh, a, an alternative weapon, what's called tactical nuclear weapons, small scale nuclear weapons. Now, when I say small scale, these still have the power of destructive power greater than Hiroshima or Nagasaki. You've all seen see pictures of what one, one bomb did in, in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So the, the idea was that a tactical nuclear weapon would be useful to stop a massive tank attack. What were tactical nuclear weapons? At first, they were bombs to be dropped from aircraft. Later on, they became shells that be fired from large cannons. They even had a small enough nuclear weapon which could be fired from something like a bazooka, uh, a, 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 a tripod mounted tube in which you had a small rocket and you had a small nuclear weapon on that. Uh, so you had aircraft, you had uh, uh, missiles and uh, that was the way things were. Uh, meanwhile, the strategic weapons, they kept on expanding, and not only were they uh, launchable from land, they became launchable from air, they became launchable from the sea. So you had submarine launch intercontinental missiles, you had land-based intercontinental missiles, and of course you had large aircraft which could fly intercontinental. So eventually the, uh, the Cold War stopped, and uh, People relaxed about nuclear weapons. And it, it, towards the end of the Cold War, it, school children had to have exercises, uh, duck and cover. Uh, since the end of the Cold War, since say the 1990s or 2000, those exercises don't exist anymore. Everybody's forgotten about nuclear weapons. 
And uh, we had at one time thousands of tactical nuclear weapons. By this time, we have hundreds of tactical nuclear weapons. To the best of I, what I can find out, the US has something around 100 tactical nuclear weapons based in Europe. They are based in American air bases in Italy, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, I forgot the others, but in any case, something in American air, in Turkey, uh, so we have tactical nuclear bombs based on aircraft which are based in American air bases in Europe, but the bombs are not loaded on the aircraft, the bombs are in underground storage, is sealed, and the bombs themselves, uh, the fuses and all that are locked, and all, the only the American soldiers present there have the codes, codes to un, unleash them. So uh, there we sat for a number of years. People forgot about nuclear weapons. Uh, it was assumed that MAD operate. What is MAD? MA mutual assured destruction. The fact that strategic nuclear weapons could render such horrendous damage, nobody would go to war. Now it turns out the Ukrainian situation seems to indicate another possibility. The existence of the fear of the use of nuclear weapons would allow people to go to war with conventional weapons. And that's what we seem to be happening right now in uh, Russia or the Russian-Ukrainian situation. Uh, the, uh, the first hint of all this that I know of was when Putin uh, sort of said, you know, I have nuclear weapons and they can do an awful lot of damage. You guys better, you better, you guys better treat me uh, respectably. Uh, and then later on, he started talking about a tremendous amount of damage his nuclear weapons could do. And that brings us to the following questions. The Soviet, uh, sorry, Russia, has an enormous stock of inter intercontinental nuclear weapons. They are used to, to keep the peace between the major nuclear powers, namely Russia, China, the US, and to a lesser extent, France and, and uh, Britain. Uh, the other nations which have nuclear weapons, India, Pakistan, uh, Israel, we don't consider them in, in this context here. Uh, that certainly they have not been rattled around as a threats to any of the major powers. But uh, the, the, the threat of uh, mutual annihilation with the exchange of strategic nuclear weapons seems to have kept the peace, mad mutual assured destruction. The fact remains that these major nuclear weapons are so placed that no first strike could wipe them out. So that if say the, the Russia were to launch a major attack against the US, it would do an enormous amount of damage, but Russia would not escape a similar amount of damage or more. So everything is nice and cool and it's been nice and cool for 20 years. Now we have all of a sudden, Mr. Putin brandishing the threat of uh, tactical of use of tactical nuclear weapons. Now he hasn't made the distinction between tactical and strategic. I'm making that. Uh, it's hard to see why he would use uh, strategic nuclear weapons because that would immediately bring in the United States. Uh, but tactical nuclear weapons is what he's hinted at. And the question is, what would happen if he did choose to use tactical nuclear weapons? First of all, there's very little reason for him to do so except scaring us. The fact remains that a nuclear weapon has an enormous amount of destructive power over a limited area. Uh, the kind of war that's going on now in the Ukraine is dispersed troops. It's not clear to me how effective how worthwhile the use of nuclear weapons would be in Russia, in the Ukraine, or in Russia for that matter. Uh, you have spread out tank armies, you have uh, motorized infantry again spread out. Uh, 
The fact remains that the Ukrainians have done a remarkably good job of stopping the, the, the Russian mechanized forces with non-nuclear weapons. What would happen if Putin does go crazy and decides to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine? I haven't got an answer to that. The fact remains that Ukraine is not formally part of NATO. If, he would, if Putin were to really go crazy and attack NATO with nuclear weapons, then we are treaty bound to respond. But assuming he's not that stupid, or I shouldn't use the word stupid, crazy maybe is the word. Uh, assuming that if he, if he restricts use of nuclear weapons, small tactical nuclear weapons to Ukraine, it's not clear what Western response should be. At least I have no suggested response. Um, the fact remains that uh, the use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine would not have a great military effect. It would have a, an enormous uh, political effect. I mean, what he could do is attack the cities of uh, Ukraine. So far, he's attacked the smaller cities. Uh, Putin has not really tried to destroy um, the major cities. He's attacked them from the outside, but it, he hasn't. He he has a big bomb fleet. He could he could flatten Kiev, uh, Kiev with ordinary bombs, which he hasn't. Uh, if he were to use uh, nuclear uh, tactical nuclear weapons, I don't see his the advantage of him using tactical nuclear weapons against Ukrainian troops who are widely dispersed. But for, but he's not the most rational person in the war in the world, as far as I can tell. And it's quite conceivable that he might threaten to use nuclear weapons against Kiev or Odessa or something like that. Uh, in other words, if you don't stop fighting, I will destroy your cities and, of course, an enormous amount of civilian population. Uh, frankly, I don't put that beyond him. Um, and the question, of course, is what would the West's response, response be? The fact remains that Ukraine has no nuclear weapons to respond with. Uh, Ukraine has actually attacked Russia proper, uh, at least one bombing attack on a Russian uh, 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 fuel facility, uh, but they have no nuclear. Now we have, we have supplied Ukraine with a lot of conventional weapons. Would we supply Ukraine with, with uh, tactical nukes? in response to a Soviet attack? I don't know. I don't know if Ukraine has the ability to deliver such tactical nuclear weapons. If we were to supply tactical nuclear weapons to Ukraine, we would probably have to deliver the means to deliver those weapons. And that probably would mean American or, or NATO troops. So I don't see how Putin can use tactical nuclear weapons against Ukraine without getting NATO involved, even if he he claims that he wants to keep the war, I'm sorry, not the war, the, the limited military exercise. Uh, he, he wants to keep that confined to the Ukraine. Although now it looks like he's even going to uh, keep it confined to the so-called Russian symp sympathetic part of Ukraine, the, uh, the, the lower uh, uh, southeast. But uh, his withdrawing from the, his forces from Kiev it's not clear whether it really means to withdraw them to the southeast and continue the, the war in, in, the, uh, in the, the Russian lead, leaning parts of the Ukraine, or if this is just a tactical withdrawal and it intends to again go after the whole of Ukraine. Uh, we, we don't know that. Uh, so really, we don't know whether his, he has made threats of using nuclear weapons, that's clear. What our response should be is, is, is completely unclear to me. Uh, we presumably could give, uh, uh, we could give uh, Ukraine nuclear weapons. They have no means of delivering them. We would have to give them delivery means as well. And how that could be separated from a war between, between Russia and the West, I don't know. So I leave you with the question of, 
uh, how secure is the world against a nuclear war? Because once a tactical nuclear war starts, we talk glibly about the difference between a tactical nuclear war and an all out nuclear war. There is no big fence between them that I know of. Once it starts, there's no end. And uh, there's, there's no, no estimate that I've seen that any nuclear war between the major powers could end with less than multi-million casualties. I'm not talking about thousands of casualties. I'm talking about in the millions. Somehow or other, we have to hope that the generals around Mr. Putin would recognize this and somehow or other control him. I have doubts about that, but I have hopes too. I think that's all I can say now without going into more details. Thank you so much, Dr. Saperstein. That was very helpful. And I know the question of uh, uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear exchange, as well as uh, fears about what might happen at Chernobyl and uh, some of the other nuclear power plants are something that a lot of us have been uh, thinking about and worrying about. So this was uh, very helpful for filling in some of the, the, the pieces for, for well, us. Hopefully, all. hopefully there will be questions about these matters and I could go on further with that. I've, I've got a question for you, but I'm going to save it to the end. <laughs> all right. Um, so I'm going to uh, now pass the mic or the virtual mic over to Dr. Fred Pearson of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. Thank you, thank you, Vincent. And by the way, if you haven't picked up on it, you just heard from a professor of physics and nuclear uh, physical physics expert who also is a specialist in science and peace. So that's his, that's his bailiwick. And I think you can get a feeling for how he analyzes things from that. We're very happy that he does this. My approach tonight is to sort of give you a taste of what we in international relations a branch of political science have as a way of understanding how this all came about. And nothing I'm going to say, by the way, should be construed as an exoneration of Vladimir Putin for his aggressive illegal war, which is a violation of international law and should be investigated by a tribunal of the United Nations for aggressive war, which has been outlawed since the Second World War and Hitler. Ironically, of course, Putin has adopted a number of Hitler's own strategies, uh, namely the attempt to reunite people by their languages, uh, language groups, and uh, the uh, sieges of major cities. The Russians can only, of course, remember Stalingrad and Leningrad that their Germans did to them, and that they survived a thousand days of resistance. But of course, he has undertaken similar activity against Ukraine. So really what goes around comes around and it's very, very disturbing. But what I'm trying to do here will be to give you some understanding of the processes at work that led to this outcome, which might have even had something might have even happened along these lines if Putin had never come to power, is the point I want to make. And there are various reasons for this. In international relations, we tend to analyze the behavior of countries, foreign policies at three different levels the individual decision maker, the state and its characteristics, and the international situation, the international system as we call it, around that state. And of course you have Putin at the individual level and he makes a difference of course with his ultra-nationalism and his uh, aggressive brutality. Uh, he's a disturber, shall we say, a disruptor. And we saw that in the American elections, we've seen that in his relationship to the EU, uh, and, uh, and so on, and of course to NATO. So he is a disruptor of the Western powers that may compete with him. But beyond that, I think there's important things to know about Russia itself and its situation and, it, and the way it came to, to this situation. Um, we know that in World War II, of course, the Russians fought tremendously bitter battles with the Germans lost something like the Soviet Union lost 20 million or so people in that war. 20 million is the casualty figure normally given. By the way, the bulk of those appears to have been Ukrainians in being the victimized population of the invasion. The invasions came through Ukraine. 
the Hitler invasion, by the way, is not the first. Uh, Napoleon in the 19th century, as we all, of course, also know, invaded Russia uh, from the West and through this path of the Ukraine. So for Russia, the Ukraine represents a, 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 an interest, shall we say, uh, of concern, who controls it and what paths are taken through it, invasion routes. Um, it's also worthwhile noting that President Zelensky has been compared to Winston Churchill recently for his inspirational leadership and rightly so, but Churchill himself, this needs to be understood, sanctioned, that is approved, formally approved of Russian control of Eastern Europe. Not well known, not well understood, but in Churchill's memoirs, he tells of sitting with Stalin alone at one of the wartime conferences before Roosevelt arrived by ship and the two of these guys were together. They didn't like each other. They didn't trust each other. They were hostile. They sat alone with their interpreters uh, Churchill describes, and they had pieces of slips of paper on a table. And on each slip of paper, this is, I think, at Yalta, which would be ironic since Yalta is part of Crimea. In each piece of paper was a name of a country of Eastern Europe, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, uh, Poland. Greece was on the, on the table, too, all the way on up to Czechoslovakia uh, all of the, and Hungary. And on each piece of paper was a ratio written, 60-40, 70-30, 80-20, 90-10. What these ratios represented was the degree of Russian or British control of these countries post-war. And Churchill points out that in Greece, it was 90-10 British. Uh, Bulgaria, Romania, um, those countries to the south, 90-10 uh, Russia. The further north you went, it was like 70-30 in Hungary and 60-40 uh, in Czechoslovakia, 50-50 in Poland. They turned to each other. Stalin took the papers and checked off each one, passed them back to Churchill, who checked them off. And uh, Churchill said to Stalin, what do you think we should do with these? Should we burn these? Because it's rather embarrassing to sit there with the fate of countries uh, and check marks and, and ratios and Stalin said, no, you keep them, you keep them. And what he meant by that was this is a deal. It's a deal. We understand each other. We'll control these, you control that. When the Greek Civil War broke out, complete misunderstanding. The West thought that Stalin was in favor of the Greek communists fighting the anti-communists and the uh, royalists in Greece. And it turned out to have been Marshal Tito in Yugoslavia for the own local reasons. Stalin kept to the, the agreement. He did not support the Greek communists. Churchill ironically later showed up in uh, Fulton, Missouri in the Truman administration to give a fa famous speech at um, Westminster College called the Iron Curtain speech, where he lamented how an Iron Curtain had descended upon Europe and divided it east and west. So uh, there's a more to Churchill than meets the eye in terms of Russian relationship. And, there's, and the Russians remembered the, 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 the arrangements in a way, post-war. Post and they of course became uh, somewhat uh, recognized as uh, a major power, a superpower along the way. Only to have the whole thing fall apart in the 90s by the way, in the 50s, I should say, before we got to the 90s, 1955, another incident of interest, Germany was not initially part of NATO in 1949. NATO was not defining who the enemy was. It was assumed, of course, that the Soviet Union might be an enemy, as Dr. Saperstein had pointed out, the potential for uh, expansion. But they had just fought Germany. And it was not, and Germany was divided, and Germany was not an initial member of NATO. In 1955, the Eisenhower administration, with a hardline Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, decided to put West Germany into NATO. By the way, we never got to Berlin, as Dr. Saperstein said. The Russians invited us there to share in the, in the occupation of Berlin, 100 miles further than we ever reached in the Second World War. 
But that division, that East-West German division, Khrushchev, who was now prime premier of Russia, chairman, extremely alarmed at the prospect of an enemy state, an arch enemy state joining NATO. And the Russians are sensitive to this. Uh, made, a, made us an astounding offer in 1955. He offered to reunify Germany and neutralize Germany, make it a neutral state on the order of Austria. Austria had already been a neutralized state. You'll note not, Austria is not a member of NATO. Uh, and uh, Khrushchev made this offer and the Eisenhower people, the Dulles people particularly, interpreted it as a sign of weakness rather than a legitimate offer of, uh, of uh, the, you know, of, of, of uh, understanding. And they refused and they brought West Germany into NATO. And we had a further division of Europe for 30 years in a Cold War situation and a wall built it might have been averted had we taken Russia up on that offer of neutralization. Interesting bypass, of byplay of history. We come down to the end of the Cold War, of course, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the formerly high status superpower, and it was one with, with uh, feet, of clay, feet of clay, so to speak, because it didn't have any commercial products that anyone wanted to buy only armament and natural resources. But it, it had achieved tremendous uh, achievements, outer space, the first launching of the Earth, of an Earth satellite. Uh, the Russians had reached the moon, so to speak, not landing there yet, but certainly uh, reaching it, circling it. And we depended on them for the International Space Station and so on and so forth. They were a superpower, a nuclear superpower, as Dr. Saperstein has described. Suddenly they collapsed after the Afghan war fiasco, and um, they fall apart. I took a group of Wayne State students to Russia in the early 90s, shortly after the end of the Soviet Union, uh, as part of a initiative that former professor Otto Feinstein had among the anthropologists of Russia at the, uh, at, at the Institute in Moscow to study the potential for uh, ethnic conflict post-Cold War, post-Soviet ethnic conflict. We went with a bunch of students to Moscow. When we got off the plane, I was astounded. There were people laying in the street waiting for ambulances. There were people on the street corner selling their clothes on, on clothing racks. No one particularly was getting paid. The complete collapse uh, of a system was evident. The Anthropology Institute people weren't getting paid. The medical people in Russia weren't getting paid. Life expectancy in the post-Soviet Russia went to 55 years, I believe, from 75 to 55, because of complete collapse of the medical system, which, which was a good medical system. Um, you can perhaps get a feeling for how Russian people responded to this humiliating decline. We in the West began to pay their nuclear scientists because we were concerned that they would begin selling off those nuclear weapons and nuclear technologies to other parties. And that, that payment system for their nuclear program lasted up until the last couple of years when Putin said, okay, enough, we don't need the money anymore. They didn't want uh, to be on the take from the West and that humiliation. But you can see the degree to which the mighty had fallen. And it's remembered so that there was a seed planted already to make Russia great again. Unfortunately, I use that terminology. I don't know about the hats, but we too had a president, by the way, who bragged about nuclear capabilities in relation to the North Koreans. I think Al forgot to include North Korea as one of the countries with nuclear weapons. When our former president said, our button is bigger than yours, Kim Jong-un. Anyway, um, this situation of humiliation was ripe for a authoritarian leader to take over. I saw a taste of the authoritarianism when we were in Moscow. The, the Russians were already having fomented the protests and, and, and proto-insurgency going on in the Yeltsin years. And they were able to search every hotel room in Moscow in one night with their uh, civil militia coming into the hotels. They came into ours. 
every hotel room in a city of what, 5 million people in one night. That capability of, of forced repression was on display uh, in the Moscow streets. There are two other, there are two key international relations concepts that I want to mention that apply to explain why Russia is moving in the direction that it is. And the public opinion polls in Russia appear to show, they, I say appear because we don't know how reliable the polling is, appear to show quite a bit of support for Putin, large amount of support for Putin, even in these, in these awful times. Two key uh, international relations character uh, uh, concepts that apply here. One is the principle of territoriality. Uh, one of the key factors in every war that we know of, international wars, is territory. Uh, Vincent Arment may, uh, may uh, you know, uh, understand here as a geographer. Territoriality is crucial in understanding international warfare. What I mean by this is very often a major power competitive with another major power comes quite close to the border of that major, other major power. And we've seen repeated incidents where that happens, where war breaks out or nearly breaks out, no matter who the leader. The first incident I would mention is Korea, the Korean War, where the United States got into a major shooting war with China. Yes, the United States has fought a war with China and it wasn't pleasant. We got too close to the North Korean Chinese border when we were uh, saving the South Koreans from the North Korean invasion, expelling the North Korean troops, and we made the mistake of following them into North Korea to try to eradicate the regime. And the Chinese immediately started warning us through third parties that if we come to the Yalu River and cross the Yalu River, they will have no choice but to come into the war. And we ignored the warnings because we reasoned that this was Russia's war, not China's war. Why would Mao Zedong want to enter into a war? I mean, he just had a civil war victory a year before in 1949, and he didn't even have nuclear weapons. We did. We had the nuclear weapons. Why would he risk such a, a war? No, it didn't make sense. The psychologists tell us about cognitive dissonance and the inability to believe information that contradicts your expectations. We blithely went ahead, crossed the Yalu River, and the next day woke up to the presence of 800,000 Chinese forces, they call them volunteers, behind our lines, infiltrated behind the lines of the American forces, the UN forces. And the rest of the Korean War, another year was spent fighting our way out of North Korea in a massive retreat. Uh, and it wasn't pleasant as we know from even watching MASH. So the Korean War was one example of coming too close geographically. Second example, Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962. The Russians this time made the mistake, I guess you'd have to say, of intending to implant nuclear missiles medium range in Cuba, 90 miles off the US shore. Lied about it to Kennedy who had photos of its, uh, you know, of, the, of the developments and he didn't tell them he knew. He went on TV, but he didn't tell them he'd caught them red handed, so to speak. And um, this almost led to World War III. We were much closer to the nuclear kind of war exchange than, than Al, than Al uh, details. And we even realized in the Cuban case, the Khrushchev tried to do this for two reasons, I think. One was to offset US missiles, which were present in Turkey uh, on near the Russian border. And secondly, to defend the Castro regime, which had just survived an overthrow attempt the year before called the Bay of Pigs, where the US uh, fomented uh, Cuban exiles to try and overthrow Castro. He thought that nuclear weapons would keep the US away. Kennedy's response was to mount a military response, a naval blockade, uh, an act of war, if you will. And um, we came nearly to blows nuclear warfare because it's a, a Soviet submarine captain was within seconds of launching a nuclear tip tor torpedo against American ships, only to be called off at the last moment by the Russian uh, uh, admiral of the fleet who caught wind of it and stopped him. That could have triggered World War III into Europe where Kennedy had promised a retaliation. So again, 
risking and, 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 and mounting resistance when the opponent gets too close. All right, in the case of Ukraine, NATO had expanded eastward after the fall of the Soviet Union. They did it without trying to tell the Russians, look, this is not hostile to you guys. We just want to move our territorial NATO uh, range closer to the Middle East. So uh, we'll take yeah, we'll take the former Soviet allies of the Warsaw Pact, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, all of them, Romania, Bulgaria, the 8020s, the 9010s, the whatever it was in the NATO, but don't worry guys, we're not aiming it at you. In fact, you, you can possibly associate with us. And Putin, when he came to power, evidently toyed with the idea, or at least said he did, of joining NATO. But I would submit to you that the reality of moving into the territorial domain of another major power with your military alliance and your military bases is a, territoriality issue because of the pattern that exists between major powers and that has existed. The other major um, concept that I wanna lay on us before I end is threat perception, but the notion of threat perception in international relations. And we have a little formula, Al, physicist uh, in, in world politics, that tries to capture the essence of threat perception. The formula is T equals C times I. T equals C times I. That means threat T is considered equal to the capability of your opponent, let's say your hostile opponent, C, times the intentions of your hostile opponent. And what that means is if your hostile opponent is very hostile to you and hates your guts, but has no capability to do anything to you, it doesn't have an army, doesn't have, you know, ragtag, your perception of threat should be zero. Anything time, you know, is zero, the capability is zero. Anything times zero should be zero. All right, but look at it the other way around. Let's say your opponent is a benign, doesn't indicate any hostile intent. The eye is close to zero, but has a lot of capability. A lot of nukes, a lot of, a lot of army, a lot of money, a lot of allies, but says that they're not hostile to you. Don't worry, guys, don't worry. Um, that should also equal zero threat, according to the formula, but that's not how it works in politics, it appears. We have specialists in the Kremlin or in Washington studying security issues, making sure that the country is quote unquote secure. And the very fact of capability and proximity, regardless of intent, is gonna stimulate threat perception. We say, well, how can the Russians think that the Ukrainians are gonna invade Russia? Well, okay, they, they can't. But the Ukrainians have been flirting with NATO and the EU for a number of years. And it came to a head, of course, in 2007 and eight under the Bush administration. The Clinton administration was largely responsible for the NATO expansion, but Bush continued it. But the George W. Bush administration got even further to say, well, let's, let's maybe fast track a potential uh, association for uh, Ukraine and um, Georgia. That's 20 minutes, see. by the way. Pardon? That's 20 minutes. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm about done. Um, in the Black Sea. That kicked it off for Putin in 2008. He invaded Georgia on the pretense of peacekeeping, if you will, between the Abkhazians and the Ossetians against the Georgian government. And he peeled off the northern provinces of Georgia in 08. The further flirtations that took place between uh, Ukraine and the EU led to the Maidan revolution, of course, and the, and the uh, uh, ouster of Lukashenko, and the reaction being the invasion and occupation of, of Crimea, which had tremendous support in Russia over there. So I will say that we could have expected these ultra-nationalist responses from Russia, perhaps even without a Putin at some point, 
when they got their stuff together and figured, well, we made agreements, but we can tear them up, which is a bad thing to do and an illegal thing to have done with Ukraine. They had agreed to denuclearize Ukraine. Ukraine gave back their nuclear weapons out. They had them, potentially. But the Russians made that deal for Ukraine's security. So did the West back it up, but nobody has stood up for it. And the Russians evidently eventually tore it up. So uh, I will uh, now yield the floor, but I wanna say quickly, my hope for the future is still around the issue of neutrality which we hear bandied around now by Mr. Uh, uh, Zelensky as a potential um, condition that he would tolerate. If there were strong security guarantees for Ukraine, Ukraine could be neutral. I wanna submit the potential of the Finland model. We can discuss it further. It's sometimes ridiculed, it's called Finlandization. Even Finland, however, now is shaken to maybe dabble with joining NATO because of Putin's aggression. So Vincent, take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Pearson. Um, I'll turn in things over right now then to uh, Dr. Uh, Victor Berlaka of the School of Social Work. Uh, just a second, I'm just working on so, okay. Okay. Um, what I would I would like to talk about um, in how much time do we have, Vincent? Twenty minutes. Okay. What I would like to um, talk about is. Um, another aspect of peace um, that is actually uh, in the society, peace in the society, in the communities, uh, because sometimes um, I feel like people who grew up in certain communities under certain circumstances, um, they develop their ideas about how the bigger world uh, should be. Um, and um, as many people have noticed uh, about um, Putin, that he potentially is someone who was deeply hurt by the idea of the destruction of the Soviet Union. And so um, what happens in the families and what happens uh, with people in the communities has uh, peace implications um, uh, be beyond the level of individuals and families. And also what happens in the societies um, also um, has implications for um, um, the mental health and well-being of people in the communities. Um, do you see the slides well? Uh, is is this working well? Yes. Okay, it's not cutting into something or into anything. Okay, so a little bit about myself. I, I'm associate professor of social work. I work at the School of Social Work um, at Wayne State University. I have a deep connection to Ukraine. I was born there, grew up there, and I had a um, full career in Ukraine um, prior to um, coming to the um, United States. Um, and most of my career I was working with capacity building projects in Ukraine, Russia, Moldova, and Kyrgyzstan. So, um, so the things that are happening today, um, uh, it's not only about my <clears throat> motherland, um, but it's also about um, decades of work uh, that we have done um, in that part of the world, um, essentially building up uh, um, a lot of healthcare institutions and, and, and social institutions um, in, in these countries. And so uh, we built up social work programs, um, programs for child preventing child abuse, um, programs for children with disabilities, how to habilitate them, rehabilitate them. Um, we build programs to prevent substance abuse among children and adolescents. Uh, we also trained hundreds of uh, young Ukrainian researchers on um, ways to do substance use research in, in Ukraine. Um, lately, I've been working with um, um, evidence-based interventions for war veterans and, and trauma survivors in, in, in Ukraine and, and neighboring countries. Uh, and then as well as crisis intervention for children and families. And one of the last projects that uh, I'm doing with colleagues uh, from Ukraine 
is um, you know strengthening the mental health services in Ukraine and we're currently developing a Ukrainian training course on DSM-5 um, manual for, for mental health dis disorders. So a little bit uh, um, um, back in time. So, uh, so this is a, um, from one of the studies that uh, um, with the data set uh, uh, from 2013. So even um, before the 2014. So here, here we can see the impact on, on different things like alcohol use frequency, uh, how it correlates uh, positively with negative um, parenting and, and how um, it uh, reduces the ability of parents to, to provide positive uh, parenting, being involved with children. Um, and so we, here we see the impact of uh, balanced family functioning, um, family flexibility, family cohesion uh, on, on parenting practices, right? So you can see that the good family um, correlates with positive parenting and, and problems um, in the family impact negatively uh, um, influence the, the, the parenting skills. So parents in these, in these families are more likely to use corporal punishment, inconsistent parenting, and poor monitoring of their children. Um, uh, and, and then of course, uh, look here, this is intimate partner violence. Uh, so um, so, 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 so the, the violence, more violence in the home um, impacts the ability of parents uh, to, to be good parents. Um, So, um, so then, you know, how, how, what, what, what correlation it has, what impact it has on mental health of, of children and adolescents. Um, so internalizing symptomatology, um, which is essentially anxiety, depression, and somatic complaints, um, depends on, on, on maternal depression. And it depends on lower use and of, of positive parenting. Um, and then poor child monitoring and supervision. The external problems that children may have, this is when they become violent, uh, when they break the rules, um, when they engage in illegal substance use, uh, is also associated with, uh, with such things as parent unemployment, um, single parenting if the mother is a widow or divorced, uh, lack of positive parenting, poor monitoring, corporal punishment. So, 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 so here's some data, um, which is just a visual. And um, this is also before the war. This is actually from 2005. Um, uh, we, we, we can see that um, the, the research, the research uh, shows that every third uh, Ukrainian uh, has had some kind of mental illness during their lifetime. Uh, as opposed to the global statistics uh, where every, about every fourth person had some mental health problems. Um, so high prevalence of, of mental health problems. And uh, in, in some of the um, um, research, we can see that um, maybe this has been um, related with historical traumas, uh, things like persecutions from, uh, from Russia, inability to use your own culture, your own language, um, Things like uh, Holodomor, uh, which is a famine, uh, when uh, in a lot of families, like in my families, where my grandmother was one of seven uh, children that survived this famine, when uh, essentially Russian communists came and took all the food from them, um, they took their businesses too and resettled them to other parts of the Soviet Union. So there was this, then there was a war, um, then uh, um, there was there was Stalin regime, um, and then we there, then there were a lot of um, things happening, turmoils happening in the Ukrainian society after independence. In addition to that, um, um, we looked at um, how do Ukrainians seek uh, professional mental health, and we discovered that. Uh, attitudes and beliefs um, um, are of importance. There is a lot of stigma about seeking mental health in Ukraine. And that um, mental health, uh, a professional mental uh, help um, 
is not commonly accepted by Ukrainians. Um, when, uh, when we asked um, Ukrainians with mental illnesses, they said that um, we feel like Ukrainian doctors, they don't have enough empathy. Uh, we don't trust them. We don't trust them that they have um, professional skills and that they'll be able to help us. So we think that this is useful pretty much. And, um, and we think that, um, that, that there is no need to go and seek help from the uh, mental health professionals. And people try to, uh, um, many Ukrainians try to solve um, their problems by themselves, by using alcohol or trying to do healthy um, behaviors like running, uh, maybe having some herbal tea, um, self-soothing, meditating. Um, when that doesn't work, people um, turn to their friends. Um, and then uh, if that doesn't help um, or requires more in, uh, extensive um, investment, more money for treatment, people will go and see uh, professionals. There are also structural barriers. Um, we saw that um, a lot of people would say that services are not available. And so um, this is the data also from 2013 and we published in 2014. Even then there were not enough services um, or locations were inconvenient, was inconvenient to go to the doctor because it, it was in another part of town. You had to travel that and, and it, was, it was inconvenient. Or um, doctor would see you in the time when uh, you couldn't go there. Uh, maybe you were working at that time or, or, or going to the un you know, being a college student, so you couldn't go there. Uh, also, uh, it was expensive. Um, uh, and people didn't believe in, in the skills of professionals or their confidentiality. A lot of times at that time, um, um, the, the providers would, um, several providers would sit in the same room and, and uh, clients would overhear each other's stories or the providers could call um, the, the university and the dean and tell the dean about the mental health issues of, um, of the students, the students reported them confidential, confidentially. So, so what does this mean for um, the current war? Um, this is the picture that my mom uh, sent me from the train when they were fleeing um, Ukraine to Europe. Um, this, this just shows um, 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 the crowded train, um, a lot of stress. People just went and um, they didn't have um, their belongings. They le left everything behind. They also left their family members behind, their sons, their, um, their fathers uh, behind. And so um, children uh, and, and mothers uh, mainly, uh, or men with disabilities could, could, could leave the country. And then when they came, uh, this is a new, uh, um, this, this picture um, I took uh, when I visited uh, Germany recently to help my family settle there. So from, from, from you having uh, had some peace and predictability, life plans, uh, maybe personal goals, you wanted to go to college, you had a job, you had an apartment or a house, uh, you had figured out everything. Now you're coming to another context, context, another country. You often don't speak a language. Uh, this is in Germany. Um, now my family members speak German. Um, and you are at a total mercy of the strangers who are good hearted people who decided to help you today. It's quite a shift uh, um, in, 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 in your world, uh, worldview and stability and the sense of peace that you have. And then uh, these are uh, famous pictures that, that we, we all see now uh, from Gastomel and Bucha. Um, these are the men that, that stayed behind to protect our country. Uh, and so what they see these days, these weeks, uh, is, is going to change the, the way they perceive the world, their values, uh, their sense of safety. So looking back uh, at this research and knowing that uh, um, the victimization, intimate partner violence uh, is an issue, we can uh, 
uh, we can think that, you know, what, what are the implications of, of what's going on right now for the mental health services and mental well-being um, of the Ukrainian people. So even here, we can see this is not an exhaustive list of things, but substance use, family functioning, domestic violence, affecting parenting with the effects uh, on mental health of children. Some of the things that come to mind uh, have to do with um, losses and, and trauma in families. Um, people have lost um, their loved ones. Um, they have lost their houses, their belongings. Uh, they have lost their, their belief in the future. Um, some of the older children, uh, uh, people like my mom, for example, uh, um, who are 70 and 80 today, um, they, uh, and if they, if they lost things today, there is no time. This is pretty much the end of their life. And it's very difficult to rebuild anything. If you're younger, then you can, you can still have those hopes. Uh, and that yes, I can adjust to, to a new context, to a new life and, and somehow rebuild my life. Uh, but for all the people, this is uh, irreversible loss. The other thing that comes to mind uh, uh, is uh, returning veterans um, that will bring those horrible memories with them back to their homes. And uh, we know um, from previous experiences with, with, with Russians and, and Donbass uh, uh, that this is a huge issue, uh, that a lot of people who come home, they have a difficult time to find themselves um, during the times of peace. Uh, they have um, a lot of guilt. Um, they have a lot of shame. Uh, they have a lot of suffering that never goes away. They relive, keep reliving the scenes uh, that they have witnessed or caused uh, during the war. Uh, another thing we, we need to think about is criminality and, and, and lack and loss of this order, public order in the neighborhoods. Um, also disrupted mental health services. So we, we know from, from our own research that uh, they were pretty much lacking before um, before the war. And now uh, a lot of doctors, they have moved on, they moved um, um, outside of the country. Um, some were killed uh, or wounded. Um, a lot of hospitals were just demolished by uh, Russian troops. Um, so, 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 so what we, the little that we had, the little that Ukraine had before the war is severely disrupted. And this is going to be uh, uh, an economic decline and, and competing needs to rebuild other sectors of economy. So one just has to think about uh, what about mental health um, or health in general? Will it be as important as uh, rebuilding the roads um, or funding the farmers so they can, they can plant their crops? And then uh, thinking about this, it's also important to think that uh, mental health needs, uh, they exist now um, both within Ukraine for the people that remain there uh, and, and people who left. Um, so people who are refugees and currently live in other countries, some of them will come back, others will not come back. So we need to think about systems to help these people, these Ukrainians who don't speak these foreign languages, wherever they are in the world. Thank you for, for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and we have quite a few questions actually that I have been uh, diligently, hopefully uh, copying here. So um, what I am going to try to do is group them together a little bit because there are several uh, that uh, each different presenter sort of has. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Saperstein. Um, and there are two questions that came up um, during the, the discussion uh, that I think you can address. The one that, the one that I had 
was whether or not you think that what is happening uh, with Russia right now, as you said, kind of using the the nuclear threat as a cover for uh, carrying out conventional attacks, which sort of is the opposite logic that we would expect. What effect do you think that this is going to have on nuclear proliferation worldwide? Will we see smaller powers uh, rushing to get nuclear weapons again um, to try to defend themselves? And then the second question I think was from Natalia Melnichuk, um, and uh, she was asking whether you could offer any insight into how the decision to launch nuclear weapons is made in Russia, who holds the launch keys, how many different people does it take to launch uh, a weapon there, um, and that sort of thing. Answer that first. I have no, no information on that at all. I doubt if very many people in the West really know that. Um, we know the American system, uh, and frankly, uh, it's not exactly clear that the American system would function as it's designed to function. In other words, if we had a crazy president like the previous one, it's quite conceivable that somewhere down the chain between his order to push the button and the actual launching of the missiles, somewhere along the line, hopefully it would not be carried out. Yeah, true in That's, Russia. I, I have no way of knowing whether that would be true in, in, in Russia. Uh, I tend to doubt it, but I don't really know. The, the, uh, the other question was uh, expansion of nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, and, and it's, it's the desire to have them to protect themselves from others. The best example I have is North Korea and perhaps Israel. And uh, going a little further, perhaps India and Pakistan, each having nuclear weapons. Uh, I mean, each India and Pakistan as far as I know, the only threats to me is from each other. Uh, I mean, there have been border clashes between India and China, but I don't think India uh, visualizes dismemberment at the, at, at, at because of Russia, of China. But uh, North Korea is ready. Uh, so the India and China, India and Pakistan is one pair, and North Korea is another. Uh, no, there are, there are countries that have had nuclear weapons that have given them up. And, uh, the, the saddest case, presumably, is Ukraine itself. Uh, there's a lot of speculation as to if, if Ukraine still had the Soviet era nuclear weapons that it once had, would Putin uh, have attacked it? And people can doubt that. But in any case, that, that's an unanswerable question. Uh, South Africa gave up its nuclear weapons. Um, no. um, okay, that's that's very helpful. Um, thank you. I'll uh, I'm going to move on just because we have so many other questions. Um, let's see. I want to maybe ask Dr. Pearson to address uh, quite a few of the questions that were all sort of uh, along a similar theme. Um, which was sort of, you know, whose, whose security and whose territory count, right? Um, you talked a lot about how Russia viewed its security threats and, and how it reacted, um, but quite a, quite a few people, uh, myself included, had, you know, piped up and said, well, but, but Poland exists and Ukraine exists and the Baltic states exist. Um, and, and so how do we square that circle, NATO itself, right, uh, is made up of countries that that have a security calculus, and um, you know, again, how come it's always sort of Russia's interests that that get put on the table as being the ones that we need to pay attention to? Right, and the same question might be asked about U.S. and Cuba, U.S. and Venezuela, U.S. and all kinds of countries in our midst, in our near abroad. There is an imbalance of power. And unfortunately, although the Ukrainians have done a tremendous job of seemingly balancing off what would have appeared to be a very uh, you know, uh, disadvantageous power position. Yes, you do have a right to choice for alliance making if you're a sovereign state, but you should also calculate carefully the implications. Where, do, where, where are you on the map? 
Unfortunately, many of the states that we're talking about, Ukraine, Poland, come to mind especially because my ancestors um, had some dealings there, um, were on the map and they were off the map. They were on the map and they were off the map. Their history has been a bouncing ball between Germany and Russia in the modern age. A little bit of France before that probably, but Germany and Russia. And by the way, the Russians still conceive of the Germans as the heart of the EU. And for better or worse, yes, they'll have a pipeline to them. But I think they're a little sensitive about German presence in the East. Again, when Germany quickly recognized the former Yugoslav republics to the disadvantage, disadvantage of Russia's favorite, longtime favorite, Serbia, the Russians responded very hostily. And so did the Serbs, unfortunately, in a genocidal response. So you have to calculate what are the repercussions of my moves? Yes, I can join alliances. Yes, I can declare independence. But can I sustain it? Or can it be sustained without destabilizing the whole area and the whole region? And I hope that the states that make these calculations are weighing all uh, sides. The Finns, as I started to mention, have come to terms with a certain position. They were occupied. They were annexed. They fought back uh, gamely in what was called the Winter War of what, 1940? Uh, but they lost to the Russians at that time as Russia tried to buffer themselves against the Nazis and the Germans. And the Finns came to terms with their location and their situation. They have emerged as a very westernized, very prosperous, very democratic state. But they do make sure to check everything out with Moscow before they do make major moves. At least that's their, been their pattern along the way. Now, we can say that it may or may not hold in the long term, but it is a model which you should, can also maybe look to as well as alliance because alliance has connotations and creates hostilities in that old calculus of C times I. Uh, yeah, and yeah, it might defend you in the end and you might need it. Poland certainly has been uh, invaded and split between the Soviets and the Germans at times. And the Ukrainians have been in and out of independence at times. I can't even find my ancestors' village, whether it's in Poland or Ukraine. I'm not even sure. It was wiped off the map. But this is all part of the country's real history. And, has, and their neighborhood has to be taken into account. Some of the neighborhoods are tough neighborhoods. That's a, that's a, a very unfortunate um, con uh, situation. And, and how then, and I'm going to jump in, um, how, how do we square T equals C times I with what we have been seeing coming out of the Russian government over the last, you know, several months, actually, um, that's that's now crystallized in former President Medvedev's uh, missive yesterday about how Ukraine needs to be de-Ukraineized. I mean, this this doesn't sound to me like security interests to me. This sounds like cultural genocide. Right. It does sound that way, but it's also bigger than Ukraine, very unfortunately for Ukraine. The Russian thinking is bigger than just Ukraine. And the capability that they're all also looking at is the capabilities of NATO and the, uh, the countries that they face to the, to the West. So yes, Ukraine is, is unfortunately a pawn. The Russians, as, I, as a cliche holds, as chess players. And uh, you can get caught up in it. Smart decision-making, and I think Zelensky is showing it. Smart decision making can maybe outsmart these big dummies on your border. All right, thank you. I, I, I know that, that you and I and probably several other people here could go back and forth on this for a while, but I do wanna make sure that we have time to ask some questions of Dr. Bolaka because there have been um, several. So let me say, uh, let, let's see. Um, one person asked, uh, the Ukraine inherited a lot from the Soviet uh, healthcare system. What kinds of changes do you see in terms of mental health services in independent Ukraine? Mm -hmm. um, and another person maybe coming from that uh, has also asked um, that you've read critiques from colleagues uh, who study humanitarianism that large aid and relief organizations sometimes focus too much on counseling and empowerment to the exclusion of food and shelter and refugee crises. From your perspective, what are the best practices for supporting mental health in acute crises like this? So I think maybe those are maybe two linked questions in some ways. 
Uh, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, th this is, uh, we are all, uh, we know this will be over sooner or later. And, 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 I, and, I, and I want to believe that um, crisis is also something that gives us opportunities. Um, and, and one of the things that uh, um, we know was uh, a problem is the legacy, the Soviet legacy in, in, the, in the healthcare system and, and uh, including corruption, including old ways uh, of, of dealing with things and, and, and awarding uh, um, contracts and money, uh, all of that uh, hopefully will go away uh, with, um, with, with after, after the war uh, ends. Um, and so uh, I'm hoping that uh, the, the new government will be more um, uh, decisive and, 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 and base their decisions on, um, um, on the best knowledge that exists in the world about how to set, set up um, healthcare systems, including mental health uh, systems. Uh, and that maybe we, we can start from scratch um, um, in terms of building the integrated services um, uh, health and, and mental health, uh, and also integrated training um, with uh, uh, practice and evidence implement evidence based practice. So I want to see as 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 a, as a comprehensive plan that includes uh, physical and mental health needs uh, in the, in the future and and deep integration with um, training programs um, that will be implemented. So like a new generation of healthcare in Ukraine kind of a jump start uh, of the whole system. That's what I want to see. Uh, com coming to the next uh, question of um, uh, about, um, yeah, there, there is one that, that is um, how do you like, how to respond to crisis um, uh, in, in the most effective way. Um, we, we, we know from our own human experience um, and from things like Maslow pyramid, that there are fundamental needs, more fundamental needs, immediate needs, and then more advanced needs. So um, uh, it, when we're in trouble, uh, sometimes all we want is, is a warm blanket and, and, and a cup of tea just to sit down and to feel that you are in, 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 the, in the space that is not open, that your body is actually enclosed in something and, and that you can feel some kind of protection and shelter on the, on the physical level on your skin. Um, and going from that, so definitely uh, the, the primary things in, 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 in such situations would be giving people food, giving people water, um, uh, letting them uh, breathe fresh air, um, uh, getting them enough sleep, um, uh, um, so, so these kind of uh, basic things. And then uh, maybe be r right after that, um, communicating to people a sense of security. You are safe. Uh, I'm with you. Um, oh gosh, it's hard to talk. <laughs> um, but but, but uh, um, those are immediate things, of course, and you can't discard them. Um, now I've seen different things that are happening right now. Um, there are a lot of people with big hearts and, and they want to help. And I've seen a range of things that are being done. I have unfortunately seen uh, very shallow efforts uh, from international organizations, um, basically uh, a dozen of cards uh, with um, a little bit of advice to parents uh, maybe four lines on each card being disseminated through uh, email, that kind of help. Um, and then a lot of publicity about this. And, 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 um, and I also, and I know also know that some people actually went to the shelters uh, and they went to, to the railway stations and they donated their time and, and they have talked to people um, and they've taken care of people um, um, directly. Uh, and, and provided the basic needs for, ba for their basic needs and gave them water and food. So there is a range of things and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue. I think right now, um, a lot of people are doing a lot of things. Um, what I would like to see at some point is um, a system uh, where uh, there could be some standards uh, 
where people would do things that are evidence-based and they're tangible, that, that, that really matter, that, that we don't see uh, a lot of shallow effort uh, for which big grants are given away, uh, but something, you know, um, material that, that will help a lot of people with uh, very little overhead costs. Um, that, is, uh, that is extremely important um, uh, in, in this time and in the next future. Uh, were there any other questions? There actually was a, a, another one uh, for you that uh, somebody wrote. Do you think that the incredible courage being demonstrated by Ukrainians now is uh, at least partly due to the resilience built up uh, through generations of trauma? The negative effects of trauma are unquestionable, but perhaps there is some hope? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, without a doubt, um, Ukrainians have been put through uh, training of that kind a lot. Um, and and um, um, a lot of resilience, uh, the resiliency that we see has been built from generation to generation, um, from, you know, mother to daughter, um, from, from father to son. Uh, this is how you do it. This is how you survive. And this is, this is how you keep yourself low key in order to survive. Maybe you can do it later on, something, some, some change later on. Um, uh, so, so e e even when when um, when we uh, had to put our heads down because we were oppressed by communists uh, as children, our parents and grandparents told us that there will be time that you, we will be able to change things. Um, but for now, you have to be safe. So, uh, so communicating that um, strength uh, and and. Um, uh, that sense that that we are Ukrainians, we have our own language. We we they they they're not gonna take it away from us, uh, no matter what. Uh, uh, and they try to do, um, and and transferring that knowledge from generation to generation has happened in in as well as historical memory uh, um, about uh, genocide that has already been uh, happening to Ukrainians uh, from Russians in in the past. So definitely, definitely, there is um, an unfortunate effect of it, uh, of suffering. Um, um, I mean, uh, effect of the unfortunate suffering is that uh, it made it made uh, some people stronger. Yeah. Vincent, could I address a question that I just saw? That's a very interesting question. Yes, ab uh, if absolutely. We had, if we had been softer or nicer toward the Russians, would, could we have prevented an invasion? Uh, in, in, in world politics, I do detect that it often nothing, off, usually nothing happens completely out of the blue. There is often a previous event that leads to the next event, retaliation, that leads to the next event, retaliation, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And in the case of the Ukraine invasion, I think that not enough attention was paid to how you make the Minsk agreement work. And they did come up with the, in the OSCE, which I think is still a hopeful institution created during the Cold War to try to create East-West understandings in Europe across the boundaries, across the lines with all the countries, not just the Russians and the Americans, but the smaller countries represented and having impact. And I think that the, for better or worse, that agreement, you know, it may have had its flaws, but it did seem to want to have a ceasefire in place in return for autonomy arrangements for the Eastern provinces in Ukraine. Now, whether that was a good formula or not a good formula, I'm, I'm not equipped to fully say, but I think it should have been further explored and further found, followed up on by either you know, the Ukrainian um, uh, officials before Zelensky and by the NATO people and the Russians together consulting in the OSCE to try to make the thing work if it was at all a serious document, which I, which I took it to be. And one other thing I'd point out about NATO, and it brings us to a little reality check about NATO. If you look at the Article 5, the famous commitment that an attack on one is an attack, same, considered an attack on all, it doesn't then say what it's going to do about it. It says that the responding parties will determine their responses based on their own constitutional principles. It doesn't say we'll retaliate nuclear for nuclear right away. It doesn't say we'll be there with troops on the first day. It says we'll do what we think is best to defend each other. So there's a little bit of vagueness built in 
to the reliability of such an institution. They once asked a French general, General, how can you assure that the United States will actually defend France if France is attacked? He said, I, I'm not worried about it. I'll take one American soldier, I'll put him at the front line, and I'll make sure he's killed on the first day. That would give me assurance that the Americans will be in the war. Well, that was a, uh, uh, a distasteful kind of facetious, I suppose, response. But it did reflect the continuing issue in NATO, which is commitment, credibility, and how do you show it? And, uh, and how do you show it without uh, overbalancing what the other side takes as hostility? So this is something for all of us to consider for the future as we go along here, even those of us who rely on NATO, even the smaller countries that have come to join NATO. Um, I, it is now almost 7.30 and I uh, will have to, to leave um, because I have a meeting that I have to be at, at eight o'clock. But I do know that there are a lot of people who are asking a lot of questions and um, I am perfectly happy to pause, stop the recording, but to uh, leave the session running. If any of the people who are our speakers or members of the audience wish to uh, continue the conversation and, and whenever the last of the, uh, the speakers leaves, just, just end the session, if that's okay, if everyone would rather just uh, close things off because everyone else has things to do, um, that's fine too. I just, somebody, sent me a, a, a private message asking me if maybe I could leave things going. So um, if, if our speakers are willing to stay on for a couple minutes more and take more questions, that's great. Otherwise, uh, I, I will close things off. So um, speakers, what, what say you? I have to go, I'm unfortunately. So I, I, I will have Fair to- Fair enough, yeah, myself. absolutely, absolutely. Well, maybe in that case, um, uh, 